dive in, I actually want to tell a little bit of background about how um, effective ele elevator pitches have helped me in my career. So I graduated from college in 2016 from the University of Alabama at Birmingham with a degree in English. Um, that's very unlike many of you, I know, who are engineers and data scientists. Um, but I worked for a couple of years at UAB after that in uh, higher education admissions communications. And that's the example I'll carry through uh, my talk today. But eventually I, I came back to graduate school here at the University of Illinois where I'm finishing up my PhD in addition to running the center. So an elevator pitch helped me get here to the University of Illinois. But once I was here, it helped me do all of these other things too. And the more effective your elevator pitch is, the better you're going to be able to do these things. Network with people in your field. Share your work with people who don't do the same work as you. So on and so forth. Now an elevator pitch won't get you a job. I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you and say that it will get you a job. But it will help you get your foot in the door to get an interview, to get your face in front of perhaps the hiring manager, right? So that's the goal here. Get a job. Elevator pitch won't get you a job, but it'll help you get one. And today I want to tell you about one particular way to go about building a really effective elevator pitch. Elevator pitches are a dime a dozen. Everyone's got one. The problem is not many of them are that good. So I hope you can leave today with a model of what the good one will look like. We're going to follow this agenda briefly. We're going to um, very briefly define what an elevator pitch is before we talk about the importance of audience to elevator pitches. You can't give the same elevator pitch to um, everyone you speak to. You have to adapt it to your different audiences. Excuse me. And then we're going to spend most of our time today uh, talking about building our pitch. What an effective elevator pitch looks like in terms of structure and organization and how you can practice it reiteratively over time. Okay? So let's start with that first, that first piece. What is an elevator pitch? Uh, we all have a sort of working definition of what an elevator pitch is. It's a very just quick introduction to three key things. Who you are, what you do, and why you do it. I always call it the, uh, I'm not the only one who calls it this, but I always call it the front door to you, okay? You're going up to strangers, you're meeting them for the first time at networking events, or at a job interview, and someone asks you the dreaded, tell me about yourself. What do you do? That's where your elevator pitch comes in. It's the front door to you. Generally, we could probably guess that good elevator pitches are any variety of things. So we're just going to list a few here. They need to be clear, they need to be succinct, interesting, um, you need to deliver them confidently, and then most importantly, perhaps, this last piece, personalize and adapt. Now what do I mean by that? Personalize and adapt. In a perfect world, we would think about our audience before building our elevator pitch. We would think about who we're talking to. Is it a potential boss? Are you talking to family and friends? Are you talking to potential colleagues? You would think about that first and build your elevator pitch based on that, considering their needs, their values, their previous knowledge about what you do, right? In reality, though, we can't really do that. That would mean um, knowing who you're going to talk to before you talk to them, more often than not. And that's just not how it works most of the time. So what we have to do is put the cart before the horse, so to speak. We have to build an elevator pitch um, sort of template and adapt it to different audiences after that, based on who you're speaking to. Because again, everyone you're speaking to has different needs, different values, different knowledge about what you do. But the key question we're wanting to think about when we think about audience, when we build our templates for our elevator pitches today, and then I send you out in the world and say, have fun, good luck. The key question we're trying to answer is how do you fit into their picture? What do they need to hear from you? 
And we do that by building a model, building a template. Now, this is one template to effective elevator pitches. This is the one I like. Um, there are many, many more. I find this to be um, the most widely useful, so to speak. Uh, you can use this in pretty much any situation, up to and including when your grandmother asks you for the tenth time, so what exactly is your job? <coughs> you can use this, okay? The problem is, this is a ton of content to pack into 45 to 60 seconds, right? Remember, elevator pitches need to be succinct. They need to be to the point. We want 45 to 60 seconds, generally. So uh, you go up to a stranger. They don't know who you are. What's the first thing they're going to ask? Who are you? <laughs> right? And this one's simple enough. Who are you? Well, I'm so-and-so. I study this at this university, or this is my job. Right? So this one's pretty straightforward. This is just the very early introduction. Who are you? I want to say a very brief note about that second bullet point, though, job title or alma mater. I think you'll find that later in your career, depending on what you do, people will care much more about what you're doing in your job currently rather than where you went to school. Um, straight out of school, your uh, alma mater carries a little more weight than maybe your job title does. Um, whereas later, you'll revert to using your job title and elevator pitches as opposed to your alma mater. So who you are is simple enough. That's name, um, where you studied, or what you currently do, and what you studied, uh, where, where you went to college. And this, in and of itself, is not competitive. This doesn't tell that person anything about you other than your name and your job title, right? So you've got to answer that question for them. What do you do? And this is sort of the first big piece of the elevator pitch. The one sentence pitch, as it's called. Um, you'll find yourself using this um, sort of in an abbreviated format too, when you don't have 45 to 60 seconds, and when someone just wants to know what you do. But the one sentence pitch is a model such that you can plug and play, okay? This is all the algebra I know. I help X achieve Y by doing Z. Math is not my strong suit. But I can tell you, X, Y, Z, to plug in different things, okay? So this answers the question, what do you do? Well, I help X, X being clients, who you work for, achieve Y, what do you help them achieve? What's the value there? By doing Z. How are you doing it? What's the method? So again, a pretty straightforward one. And in the case of an example, um, I mentioned that I worked for a couple of years in uh, higher ed communications before coming back to graduate school. That's where I pulled most of my examples from um, because that's my corporate experience, really. So um, in my elevator pitch from those days, I would say that I help colleges and universities tap into new enrollment streams um, by adapting and managing their messaging to different audiences. That's a really fancy way to say I work in communications. <laughs> right? But it's much more specific than that. It tells them pretty specifically what I do, what the emphasis of my job is. I focus on enrollment, getting new students to the university. And I do that by creating and managing different communications different types of messages to different people. So, if we break this down, we can see I help who? Colleges and universities, that's the X. Tap into new enrollment streams, that's the Y, the value, by adapting and managing your messaging to different audiences. That's the method, okay? Does telling someone a very brief sentence about what you do um, prove that you're good at your job? <laughs> Hey folks, we're back up here. Thanks. Does it prove that you're good at your job? No. <laughs> you want to convince a potential employer that you're good at your current job, right? 
You gotta provide evidence for that claim. Saying what you do, you want them to believe you're good at your job. You gotta provide evidence for that. And we're gonna do that with a narrative example. By narrative example, we mean just a very short, compelling experience or compelling story example that helps you make your case that you are indeed good at what you say you do, okay? If any of you, I mean, the interns in the room probably went through an internship interview. If any of you have gone through a job interview before, you may have been asked a question um, that you, they wanted you to respond with the STAR method. Has anyone heard of the STAR method before? Yeah, show of hands. A few of you. Awesome. So the SCAR method in interviewing is a way you would answer a question about a difficulty that you've had in a previous job, where you were presented with a problem and you had to come with, up with a solution. It's the same just here. Now SCAR, because the corporate world loves acronyms, stands for Situation, Task, Action, Result. What you're trying to do here is create a problem-solution structure. You want to say that there was this problem that you encountered in your current or previous role and that you solved it in this way. But we're going to drag that out a little bit. So, building from my example that I'll carry through the rest of the day, um, in a previous role I had at the Regional State University in the South, um, we were facing a really big problem where um, we weren't having enough enrollment from rural counties in the state. And it was my job to address that problem. It's a big problem to address, okay? So I've created a problem here, or I've situated that there was a problem that I had to manage. I've grouped task and action here in the second point because they're a little redundant. You can group them together too. So what did I do to address this problem? Well, I created a new comms plan. I created a new plan that catered more to what that audience wanted to hear, right? To the demo, to that, that it better appealed to the demographics we have in the world. It's a pretty specific task or action that I took. Right? Um, is there anything yet that suggests that was effective? There's no result. So what's the result? Well. I give something very specific here. Um, in situations like these, you don't always, okay. Numbers are not the only form of evidence, okay? But you want something tangible, you want something concrete. You want to be able to quantify the result as best you can. So, I tack on to the end of this problem solution. Well, we know this worked because enrollment went up by 33% from these specific counts. Okay, so I've um, tied in a very, very brief story about a problem I faced in a previous role, how I acted to solve that problem, and whether or not my action was effective. Now obviously if it wasn't, I wouldn't be telling this story. <laughs> if, if it had not worked, I would not bring it up in an elevator pitch. So this narrative example that you're tying into um, your one sentence pitch to, to demonstrate that you are in fact good at your job it might require you to think a little bit more than the one sentence pitch. But presumably, in all of your roles this summer, as interns or otherwise, you face problems in your job. Or um, your, your job is in part to address a broader problem. Okay? I encourage you, as you finish out your internships or continue in your career, continue to revise these different examples. Okay? Um, as you face different problems, take note of them. Take note of the solution, because again, adapting to your audience, you'll change these out. You won't use the same example for every elevator pitch you give. Okay? Cool. So last thing, you gotta wrap it up. You can't just tell them, I'm good at my job and here's evidence of it. You want them to hire you, right? So you need to be pretty clear about how you can help them. So you have this experience elsewhere. 
you had this problem, you solved it, that's evidence of a great good job. How can you help them with that experience? So we're working with the last step here, value add. Um, I discovered this typo right before I showed up today. This should say connect back to narrative example, not to one sentence pitch. So I apologize for that. But you want to connect back to your narrative example and reiterate what you did. Just summarize it. Summarize very quickly what you did in that moment before um, you tell them or connect to them what value you could add for them. Remember the key question, how do you fit into their picture? What problem can you solve for them? What role can you fill for them? Okay? Um, as I went around in the narrative example, and I waited to address this because I wanted to make sure it was there, I heard a lot of we were the company I work for. Even with the solution, it's okay to say I. <laughs> it's okay to say you did something. I came up with a solution, or I was on a team that came up with a solution. Lead with I. You want the first person I throughout, but you especially want it here. Because the question in this last section that employers are going to be asking is why you? If other people encounter the problem you encounter, they might solve it in a similar way. So why you specifically? And that's why you're connecting to the value that you could add for them. So, one last time, in the case of the example I've been using, I first summarize exactly what I did to address the problem, um, and then I close with a very, very vague <laughs> and very brief, I hope that I can have the opportunity to help you or whatever company um, find those different avenues for communication to. This would be ideal for some sort of situation where a company was maybe struggling to find new clients or new source uh, revenue streams because of bad communication. So, one last time to summarize, connect back to that narrative example. What did you do? Summarize it for them. And then connect to value. What, can, what value can you add for them? It can be vague, it can be specific, whatever feels comfortable in that situation, okay? So, two minutes, three minutes actually, amongst your tables, this is the last time, I promise, okay? Go for it. And um, I'm going around, I'm hearing a lot of people have this basic structure mapped out, which is great. And now we're gonna talk about a, a decent way to practice this elevator pitch. And I know what you're thinking. He's going to tell me to practice my elevator pitch. I am going to tell you to practice your elevator pitch, um, but I'm also going to give you a way to practice your elevator pitch. Um, I also teach in the communication department over on the main quad, not far from here. And uh, when I tell my students, okay, go practice your presentation, um, it seems that they want to just go home and rote memorization, like commit it to memory. And that's an ineffective way to practice a presentation um, as short as an elevator pitch or as long as the one I'm giving today. So instead, we treat practice as a process, steps that build on top of each other, okay? I'm gonna go through this briefly because it's at the bottom of the handout that you have in front of you. You can take it with you if you want. But you want to start with big picture details. The best way to do that is just by jotting down your actual elevator pitch and managing the, the big picture structure, figuring out what goes where. Um, the who are you is pretty simple, but what goes in your one sentence pitch versus what goes in the narrative example? Those are decisions you want to make in step one, and you want to commit that big picture organization to memory before you move on to details. In step two, with details, you're shortening that to an outline, you're working from that, you have the big picture organization down pat, and you're beginning to focus on nailing down those details. This would be, say, um, the star method. What story are you telling? Okay, the details of that story. Step three, then, practice in front of people you trust before you take this out into the real world. I cannot stress that enough. 
Um, things like this, these are intimidating. Practice in front of colleagues, practice in front of friends, family, etc. Um, and this is also the stage that you have the pitch pretty, pretty much down pat, and you want to encourage them to ask you follow-up questions. So, if you came up here and you asked me what I do, I would have a pretty canned response elevator pitch for you. If you ask me follow-up questions, I would have a more difficult time with that. And I'm sure that's the case with many of you, too. You're, you know what you do so well that you don't know where the gaps are. People are going to ask follow-up questions, and you need to know how to respond to those. So practicing in front of friends, family, people who don't do what you do, will naturally encourage those follow-up questions that you will need to practice responses to. Okay. So once you feel comfortable with that, you take it, you begin adapting it to different audiences, thinking about what you would change if you were talking to a potential boss versus potential colleagues, for example. Your story's gonna change a little bit, the elevator pitch is gonna change a little bit. And then finally, take it into the real world. Practice it there. Recognizing that it's not gonna be perfect. It's gonna take time. This is a reiterative process, something you have to keep working on, keep revising, keep adapting, okay? Um, for those of you, we'll skip the summary since we're low on time. For those of you who are still on campus, um, here's a shameless plug for part of my job, the Speaking Center. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm the director and lead consultant um, of the Speaking Center over in the main library, and we offer, at the moment, two primary services um, that we're working on expanding this fall. So the second one are workshops like this, okay? We offer a, a different elevator pitch workshop for the general campus community. We also offer workshops on coping with speech anxiety, if that's something you, um, you handle, deal with. It's really common. Um, I teach this stuff and I have speech anxiety. Uh, so we offer a workshop on coping with speech anxiety, we offer workshops on building effective visual aids, and so on and so forth. Take a look at our calendar come mid-August for the fall schedule. But our more popular service are one-on-one -on -one consultations where you can come in and work one-on-one -on -one with me or one of our other consultants um, to get individualized, personalized feedback on what you need specifically. Okay, so if you need help with your elevator pitch specifically, you can come in and chat with one of us. We'll be happy to help you. This also goes for class presentations, um, different job interview skills, for example. Um, we work uh, decently closely with the Career Center on job interview prep. Um, so we're also, we are also able to connect you to other campus resources if you need. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you all for being um, such a good audience and for humoring me by chatting at your tables. Uh, you can find our website down there in the bottom right, as well as our email address. If you have any questions about the talk today, want to learn more about this or the speaking center, you can shoot me an email or visit our website. Cool? Thanks again, everybody. Appreciate you.